Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. My name's Maggie. I'm a professional MCAT tutor, current med student. I run this channel. You guys know the drill. So today I'm back with part two of the lab techniques portion of our high yield series. So this high yield series covers high yield topics on the MCAT and we have a book that we're kind of using as a guide on what videos to make. And this chapter is separation techniques, lab techniques, and research methods, but that's a lot. And I've already made a video on research methods and I made a video on some of the other lab techniques. It was getting a little long, so I wanted to make a separate video on chromatography because that's probably the most high yield of these uh, type like separation techniques or lab techniques. And there's also a lot that goes into it. So without further ado, as a little outline, today we're gonna cover all the chromatographies, including thin layer chromatography and all the column chromatography, so anion and cation exchange, um, affinity chromatography, also going to be talking about gas chromatography and de Bartosin to size exclusion chromatography. So let's get right into it. And the first one, one that we're going to be talking about today is thin layer chromatography or TLC. And you probably are familiar with this from your organic chemistry labs. So all chromatography as a whole is going to separate things based on polarity. Pretty much. We'll get into the exceptions later. But TLC does. So the setup for TLC looks like this. You have a plate that's pretty much like a piece of paper. And you have this beaker that it's inside. And you have a solvent at the bottom. And on this little plate that you've prepared, you have dotted solutions at the bottom. You see that they are above the line of the solvent, but they are just right above it. That's purposeful. So the basis of TLC and how it um, separates things based on polarity is that this piece of paper right here is as a rule polar. It is coated in silica gel and silica is very polar. And so this is the polar phase or the stationary phase. And this is the mobile phase. So in chromatography, you're always going to have those stationary and those mobile phases. They're not always going to be like specifically the stationary as the polar one and the mobile is the nonpolar. Again, we will get into that, but usually they will tell you. But in plain TLC, the stationary phase is going to be the silica gel plate and that is the polar one. And you're going to have an organic solvent that's nonpolar at the bottom. So this organic solvent, moves up. So this organic solvent moves up the plate and as it moves up the plate, it's going to encounter these little dots of these compounds that you have dotted at the bottom. And these compounds that you've dotted at the bottom are a mixture of a lot of different molecules. And so what you're trying to do, this is a separation technique, you're trying to separate it. And you're gonna be doing that based on polarity. So as this um, organic solvent moves up the plate, it's going to drag along the nonpolar things with it. Now the polar things that are within this little dot, like for instance, this is what it looks like when it gets done. The polar things are gonna to wanna to stick to that silica plate. So they're gonna stay really close to the bottom. So this little red dot right here is something that's polar, but something like this blue dot is not going to want to stick to the silica plate. It's going to want to travel up with that organic solvent because like dissolves like. So you get something like this at the end of it all, or I think really like this that I drew is a better picture because like I'm trying to reinforce this idea that what you dot at the bottom is a mixture of things. So you see, we all know our um, colors and everything. So orange is a mixture of red and yellow. So once you run the organic solvent up this plate, it's going to separate whatever is at the bottom bottom into its constituents. You can also find what's called the RF value or the retention factor value. This is like not as high yield for the MCAT, but you'll probably remember it from your chemistry class. So I think it's worth saying. And all that that is, the retention factor, is the distance traveled by the component, which is the little dots, divided by the distance traveled by the solvent in total. So you would take, you know, if we're looking at this right here, you would take, um, you know, however far that this little red dot traveled above the line that we dotted it on and divide that by how far the entire solvent went. So you can see this red dot maybe went one-tenth of the way that this solvent did. So the retention factor would be 0.1. Whereas something like um, this gray dot may be closer to like 0.5 or 0.6. Again, I don't think that that's as high yield for the MCAT, but I thought I'd say it. You can have reverse phase TLC. And I see this a good bit on the MCAT because they want you to know that the stationary phase is usually uh, the silica gel. That's usually the polar one. And so when they say reverse phase, what they want you to know is that they flipped them. And now the stationary phase, the piece of paper is um, the nonpolar one. And they've put a polar solvent here at the bottom. So they really are, they might show you a plate or something. And they really just want you to know that the ones at the top, if it's normal TLC, then the ones at the top will be the nonpolar ones. Or if it's reverse phase, then the ones at the top will be the polar ones. The ones at the top are the ones that match the polarity of the solvent. 
that's what you need to know. Okay, moving on to column chromatography. Column chromatography is a big category that includes affinity chromatography and ion exchange and size exclusion chromatography. I don't I don't know if gas chromatography is technically considered column chromatography. It uses a column, so maybe, but we'll go over all of those in detail. The first one that I think is important to um, understand and easiest to understand is affinity chromatography. So what you have is you have this tube right here. This is your column, and it's got all these little beads inside of here that I've drawn in. And you're going to be pouring something into here, letting it go through all these beads, and then you're going to collect whatever comes out of the bottom. That is the liquid that is eluding from your column. So for affinity chromatography, you are pouring in a compound, a solution that has a lot of different molecules in it. And say if you are looking for cysteine, you want to separate the cysteine out of your solution. You use whatever has a high affinity for cysteine as your beads. So I looked it up and this is not important for y'all to know. I had to look this up. But if you're looking for cysteine, then these are gonna be avidin, I don't know what this word is, but you're going to use this as your beads because these two bind to one another. So as you pour in your solution that has cysteine in it, cysteine is gonna bind to all these little avidin like beads. So what's gonna come out first is not the cysteine. It's gonna be everything else that's in the solution that did not want to bind to this avidin. So once you've done that with all of your solution and now your column, all it has in it is just the cysteine that's attached to this avidin, then you're gonna do a washout and you're going to put in something that's gonna break this connection that these two have. And all you will have at the end is pure cysteine because that's all that was left that was so tightly bound to these beads. So I think that that's relatively important to keep straight, like what's coming out first, what's eluding first, and then for the different types of chromatography, like what are the beads going to be? So for affinity chromatography, it's gonna be something that has a high affinity for the molecule that you're wanting to separate out. Now moving on to ion exchange, so there's anion and cation, and the hardest part of this is keeping straight, what are you looking for? So just know, if it's a cation exchange, you are looking for cations. And so you're pouring the solution full of a lot of stuff in, but what you want is the cations. So it makes sense that cations are going to bind to anions. So you want this tube to be filled with anions so that when you pour that solution in, all the neutral stuff and all the negatively charged stuff, that's just gonna flow straight through, right? But what is going to stick are those cations that are in your solution. They're gonna stick to the beads. And again, like other forms of chromatography, at the very end, you're gonna do a washout where you do whatever. I'm not sure of the full process to get these cations off of the beads, but you're gonna do a washout so that at the end, you will just have cations in solution. So that's cation exchange, and it uses negatively charged beads. This is anion exchange. So it's the exact same thing, except you're using positively charged beads, and you want the anions to stick to the beads while you're pouring the solution through, so that at the end, you can just wash it out and all that will be left is those anions that were stuck to the beads. So just keep that straight. Cation exchange, you want cations out of your solution. So you use a negatively charged column and then the opposite for anion exchange. Okay, size exclusion chromatography actually does not separate things based on polarity. It separates things based on um, size. As So again, you're gonna have this tube that's filled with these beads, but I've kind of drawn a close up of the beads because for size exclusion chromatography, you have these porous beads. And really it's more like beads with little different sized channels inside of them. And so when you're pouring in a solution that has a lot of different molecules in it, those molecules are going to be differently sized. And this is the hard part for me. It's kind of like different than gel electrophoresis. If I pour something in there and I have these beads filling the inside of this column, if the molecule is really big like this, this is a molecule, this blue thing that I'm waving around, Not this is not a bead, this is the bead. If I'm pouring these molecules in, this thing's gonna bump into the beads and just roll right on around them and go into the elution. But if it's kind of a medium size, look, it's gonna bump in and it's gonna find this little channel, it's gonna go through here. But the sheer fact that it has to kind of go through this little channel is gonna slow it down. And these beads are made in such a way to where if you have this really, really small molecule, it's gonna find these complicated pathways and these little tunnels and it's going to travel through and that's going to take a really long time to get through all of those beads. So for size exclusion chromatography, the important part is that your largest molecules are going to elute 
first, followed by your medium molecules, followed by your small ones. And that is just a function of the time that it takes to get through all these little tunnels that are in all these little beads. Now, gas chromatography. So when you're talking about all these different types of column chromatography, and it's more important for like ion exchange and affinity chromatography, like if you look at this, look at this cation exchange right here. The mobile phase is going to be whatever your solution is. And the stationary phase is going to be your beads. So for cation exchange, you have a negatively charged stationary phase. So moving on to gas chromatography, gas chromatography is separating things based on their volatility. But really what you need to think about is that it's separating things based on their boiling point because these mean very similar things. If a gas is very volatile, then that means it escapes into the gas phase very easily, very quickly. And that is a similar concept to having a very low boiling point. So a gas chromatography takes advantage of that. And so you have, the, again, as always, this solution that's full of a lot of different things that you wanna separate out. You're gonna heat all of this solution up until all of it's vaporized and going into this column here. So your mobile phase, again, is going to be like all of this solution that's running through here, and it's usually suspended in like an inert gas. And then your stationary phase is going to be here on the sides. And the stationary phase is, I think it's usually like literally just the sides of the column, or I think that they can put like uh, some kind of gel or something that's like got a high polarity and so it doesn't boil easily. But anyway, as always, the important part is what are you getting out at the end, what's coming out first. So things that are very volatile, have a low boiling point and want to stay in the gas phase are not going to interact with the sides of this column. They're just gonna go straight through. But things that are more polar, things that have a lower volatility, things that have a higher boiling point, they're going to interact with the sides of this and they're gonna say, well, yeah, I kinda like staying in my liquid phase. I don't really care too much to go into the gas phase because it's not very volatile. And so it kinda sticks around with the stationary phase a little bit longer. So what you get out first is your most volatile compound and it has the lowest boiling point. And what you get out last has your highest boiling point. So in a way, I feel like it's kind of splitting hairs to decide whether or not you are actually um, separating things based on polarity with gas chromatography because like polarity has such a tight influence on boiling point. It's like, yes, indirectly. Okay, the last thing I wanna say about um, chromatography is that sometimes they will just tell you what molecule is a certain phase and they want you to know whether it's nonpolar or polar. So I would know just a couple common nonpolar and polar solvents. Some polar solvents would be water, DMSO, DMF, and acetone. Your nonpolar solvents are gonna be your benzenes, your diethyl ethers, your alkanes, and toluene. So yeah, I think the important part to remember for gas chromatography is that usually they're going to ask you like, what's eluding first? They're, they're all polarity questions. This is the way that they're going to test polarity. And so really, if you know what your mobile phase is and what your stationary phase is, and you know the polarities of those, then you should know that whatever's in your solution is just going to follow whatever polarity it matches up with. So the nonpolar things in solution are going to go high up on your TLC plate or they're gonna stay low down on your reverse phase TLC sheet because they want to stay with the nonpolar plate. If you're talking about ion exchange, then whatever has the opposite charge of your stationary phase, it's what is going to elute last. That's what's going to stick to those beads. So it all makes sense if you're pretty solid on your concepts of polarity and solubility. And for the ion exchange, then your kind of electricity, like opposite charges attract kind of thing. But I know that they're all really hard to keep straight in your head. So just just take the most important things and make sure you remember those little details like cation exchange is looking for cations and so it has anions in it or that affinity chromatography uses um, a stationary phase that has a high affinity or a tag sometimes they'll call it a tag for your molecule of interest and then you should be pretty set even though there's a ton of these chromatography things they're all kind of doing the same thing. Okay, that was my chromatography video. I hope you guys enjoyed it. I hope you guys learned something. Or if you already knew all that, I hope I made it a little bit simpler in your head. Make sure to check out the description below if you want to see any of our projects. We have a high yield ebook that kind of parallels this uh, series. And we have a lot of exciting projects coming up that I just cannot wait to announce. But make sure to like and subscribe and comment below what you want to see next. Bye.